One of the most quoted passages in the entire Bible is, Judge not, lest ye be judged. But how is it possible if that passage never existed? The scripture, Judge not, lest ye be judged, does not exist in any translation of the Bible now, and it never has in the past. If you look at all of the major Bible translations, it isn't there. Even the King James Version says, Judge not that ye be not judged. The only one with a lest in it is an obscure NASB 1977 version, but it says, Do not judge lest ye be judged. And so, if you go back all the way to the original KJV Cambridge 1611 version, it also says, Judge not that ye be not judged, as you can see in the image. And so it is in every translation thereafter. So all the way from the 1611 till now, no Bible version or modernization has ever included the words, judge not, lest ye be judged, not one, nowhere, and never. So how is it possible that every sinner, every saint, every movie, every publication that ever quotes Matthew 7 does so incorrectly? I've been told by pastors... <laughs> that it's because some time ago, someone probably misquoted it, John, in a sermon, and it went through the entire world like the telephone game. <laughs> the idea that one misquote would be able to overcome the influence of every Christian, every pastor, reading their Bibles every day, seems patently ridiculous. I mean, how could that possibly happen? Yet these are the lengths that church leaders are going to in an effort to avoid the obvious. How is it possible that if you ask a hundred pastors, hey, pastor, who laid down with the lamb? Every single one, without exception, will tell you the lion. And their recall will be effortless and immediate, and their certainty will be at or near 100%. Yet, if you turn to Isaiah 11.6 in any translation, you'll find that it is in fact the wolf that is always laid down with the lamb, all historical writings, commentaries, concordances, books, movies, pubs, ministries called the Lion and the Lamb, sermons, both written and recorded, and all Bible translations, without exception, going all the way back to the Dead Sea Scrolls, have always said wolf. Nowhere can you find any reference to the lion laying down with the lamb in any official publications, documentation, or writings. Isaiah 65 also says wolf, so it's not being confused with that passage. Do you have any idea what the statistical probabilities are against virtually every pastor and every Christian getting such an enigmatic passage incorrect every time and getting it wrong the same way? Just these two examples alone seem virtually impossible to explain, but there are hundreds more examples in multiple categories. Now, sociologist studies have shown that this type of misremembering where such a high percentage get it wrong the same way is virtually a statistical impossibility. So if it isn't misremembering, what could it be? Well, this experience that I've just described is so widespread that major news publications are now being forced to cover it. Mainstream news is doing exposés Movies are being made about it. Social media is on fire on this topic. Facebook has close to 100 groups dedicated to trying to explain how this could be happening. And as you can see from Google Analytics, search results for the term Mandela Effect seem to skyrocket sometime around 2016. That has caused a lot of people to suddenly start claiming this experience was real. And if you talk to them, you'll find that they are implacable, they're inconsolable, and the reaction to this experience can only be described as unbridled astonishment. It's turning people's lives upside down, and church leaders mostly have never even heard of it. The idea that this can easily be explained by misremembering is not only unconvincing, but is extremely insulting. There is a vast difference between misremembering what you had for lunch yesterday and then waking up one day and finding out that your name is different than what it's always been your entire life, even though all of your documentation prove that it's different from what you remember. Many of the things that we are claiming that are now different are as vivid as our names. 
And vivid memories can't just be dismissed so easily. And let's not forget that human memory is admissible in court. 18 U.S. Code 3502, admissibility and evidence of eyewitness testimony. And the National Library of Medicine concluded that it is generally assumed that memory is highly accurate and largely indelible, at least in the case of strong memories. And one would think that if God commands you to remember, that you must be able to do it. First Chronicles 16, 15, remember his covenant forever. Isaiah 49, 15, John 16, 4, Deuteronomy 8, 18, First Chronicles 16, 12, Deuteronomy 9, verse 7, remember, do not forget how you provoked the Lord. And of course, numerous long-term studies prove beyond any shadow of a doubt, despite popular opinion, that human memory is extremely reliable. Results of this study showed that participants who were tested within 15 years of graduation were about 90% accurate in identifying names and faces, and after 48 years, they were accurate to 80% for verbal and 70% for visual. So, whatever side of this controversy you fall on, the one thing that you cannot deny is that there is a controversy. And whether you believe it or not, it is a phenomenon because there has never been an event in recorded history where millions of people have suddenly succumbed to the same mental illness virtually overnight. Millions of people don't suddenly get the same mental illness and become crazy. And so by insisting on the crazy explanation, you are actually only condemning yourself because you are also misremembering the same way that crazy people are. We believe the lion lay down with the lamb, and you believe the lion lay down with the lamb. That's what your memory tells you. The only difference between us and yourself is the conclusion that is drawn. You may try to force this into a naturalistic explanation to avoid having to consider the unthinkable and be forced to admit that the Bible is changing, while others have chosen to trust their memories and their conscience, their soul, and their intuition, and they look to God to sort out this doctrinal quagmire. But the evidence becomes even more unequivocal when you learn that there are six other kinds of proof that corroborate these memory anomalies. Taken together, this mountain of evidence is forcing more and more believers to reluctantly concede that there is an end time sign and wonder that somehow includes the Bible being supernaturally changed by the enemy of God. Now, this suggestion that such a thing could be taking place does invoke a visceral reaction for good reason. The scripture seems to clearly teach that it cannot change. The passages that teach providential preservation are then circumscribed around the clear testimony that God cannot lie. Therefore, suggesting that Satan is somehow able to manipulate matter and override the stated words of the Most High God would be tantamount to calling God a liar. If the Bible says that his word is forever settled in heaven and God cannot lie, there should be nothing to discuss. This, of course, is the belief that many of us held as well. That is, until we were convinced that the Bible was changing and we were forced to reconsider our long-held beliefs. We're not charlatans or biblically illiterate boobs. We're your brothers and sisters, and we're dedicated, learned followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are demanding that our church leaders drop their gods long enough to hear our evidence before rendering a decision. Proverbs 18.13 says, He that answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame unto him. So, we were then forced to go back into the Word and prayerfully request that God would show us if this idea could somehow be supported by Scripture or to show us if we had somehow fallen into some sort of delusion. Well, what we found was that the Bible does appear to clearly predict this event with stunning accuracy. And we are not, as some have suggested, torturing the Scriptures to support our twisted delusions. What is happening is more in line with the words of Daniel in chapter 12, when God said, shut up the words until the time of the end. Could it be 
that the idea of shutting up the words here in Daniel 12 might mean that no one could understand the meaning of the prophecy in Daniel 7, 25, until the event that that prophecy was describing took place. It was essentially shut up from the people's understanding, only unlocked by the event itself. Only when the mystery that it was describing unfolded could someone possibly be able to properly exegete this passage and understand its meaning. The idea that the Bible is teaching that it cannot change and at the same time teach that God would allow it to be changed seems impossible to reconcile, but it's not. Upon closer examination, there are a variety of explanations as to how this event can be taking place and does not compromise any of God's divine and infinite perfections. Praise the Lord. You're probably aware of denominations different from yours that hold a doctrine that you disagree with. You can see its flaws and see how their position is really unsupported by Scripture. Well, I'm suggesting that providential preservation seems to rely on some very subjective passages. It looks like it teaches that the Bible can't change, but what it really says is his word is forever settled in heaven. These two things are not necessarily the same thing. It is not unorthodox to suggest that the term Scripture and the term Word of God are not the same thing. Remember also that this is a sign and a wonder. It's an end time sign and wonder. If it didn't blow your mind, it wouldn't be a wonder, would it? What the Bible calls an end times sign and wonder, pop culture has dubbed the Mandela Effect. Now, if you believe the Mandela Effect is simply mass hysteria or a few people misremembering that is then being amplified by the internet, you are mistaken. Estimates based on a variety of sources now clearly indicate that the number of people claiming this experience is in the millions. Many are Christians that are sitting in your congregation and they're looking for answers. This event is dividing families, friends, and churches and seems to be affecting every Bible, every recording, every book in the world right now right down to your grandmother's Gutenberg Bible in the attic. So it doesn't seem to be something that church leaders can ignore any longer. My ministry is dedicated to helping pastors, church leaders, and Christian influencers to sort through the many voices surrounding this phenomenon and help shorten your learning curve so that you can properly evaluate what you think is truly happening. We provide in-depth biblical analysis of this event, one-on-one -on -one support, and weekly mastermind groups for church leaders that are wrestling with the idea that this is really happening and the unimaginable doctrinal ramifications of this on discipleship, faith, doctrine, and many other questions. My goal in this initial overview is to introduce you to several underlying beliefs that I believe must be addressed if you're going to be able to give yourself permission at the subconscious level to even consider this. If this summary bears witness, then I have prepared more in-depth overviews on each topic and placed them on a YouTube channel that is dedicated to church leaders. So in the next 10 minutes, I'll give you a summary of some of the Bible prophecies that seem to predict this event, how this could be happening without diminishing the inerrancy of the word or impugning God's character, and mindsets that undermine church leaders' ability to even consider this. Obviously, the first question that must be addressed is how and why could God possibly allow this? Well, what mortal creature can possibly understand how God has chosen to run his universe? The mystery of free will is enough to thrust anyone into a theological tailspin. Is it not written that it's the glory of God to conceal a matter and the glory of kings to seek it out? But then we find that although what is written in Scripture is sufficient for men to know and obey God, some might suggest that it seems a little limited and even cryptic in its scope to fully understand the mind of God, and we're forced to look through a glass darkly. You have to fast and pray to get the mind of God. He even told Miriam and Aaron, It's true, I speak to my people in dreams, but Moses I speak face to face. So God essentially admitted that he doesn't tell us everything. And so the hiddenness of God and how free will allows so much evil to prevail in this world is an unanswered question 
that has been debated by the greatest theologians for centuries. All that to say that the secret things belong to God, and if you're like me, there have been times past when God himself had to do some adjustments on my theology. For me and many others, this was one of those times. I'm a fundamentalist, orthodox, and conservative believer in my theology. I am a born-again, spirit-filled believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, and I have always refused to accept any idea that is contrary to Scripture. So the idea that those of us who claim this experience to be exotic are raising up our memories above the authority of Scripture could not be further from the truth. The principle of being a good Berean dictates that we should at least be permitted to respectfully question long-held orthodox beliefs, such as providential preservation, without reprisals. If God's ways are past finding out, then who are you to question the testimony of those claiming it's true without first giving it honest consideration? I say that because I have found that when most church leaders are approached with this claim by their own trusted followers, they typically respond with a triggered, unresearched response that can only be characterized as a dismissive rush to judgment. These snarky, knee-jerk reactions of most church leaders in relegating this to the category of a conspiracy theory has caused many true disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ to leave the church and not look back. You are losing people to this, and you don't even know it. I know this because they're joining my ministry and others like it in droves. And it's time for church leaders to briefly set aside their preconceptions and give this topic the consideration that it deserves. Let's just start by looking at the prophecies that seem to foretell this event and then look at how that could possibly override or modify what seems to be the clear promises that the Bible is impervious to the devil's parlor tricks. So many of us notice the changes in pop culture, geography, history, and entertainment before we learned that it was also affecting the Bible. The fact that we were already convinced that our reality was somehow malleable did tend to make it easier to accept that it might be happening to the Bible as well. However, I thought the Bible is sacrosanct and, and seemed as though it would be impervious to such a thing. So I, like many, have asked God to confirm that I was not slipping into some sort of delusion and that the event was truly changing the Bible as well as everything else. So Daniel 7.25 was the first passage that seemed that it might be addressing this event directly. According to an excerpt from an article called The Nations and Prophecy found on Bible.org, the seventh chapter of Daniel provides the most comprehensive, detailed prophecy of future events to be found anywhere in the Old Testament. Daniel 7.25 is a passage that speaks of the activity of the Antichrist in the last day. It says that this activity will invoke great swelling words being spoken against the Most High God, and it will wear down the saints. Scripture can sometimes have a dual meaning, and it's possible that this passage may be referring to events during the time of the Antichrist while also describing the Mandela effect. Could it be that covertly inserting blasphemies, paradoxes, and innuendo into Scripture would be the fulfillment of speaking against the Most High? And any pastor, certainly trying to reconcile these distorted passages, would certainly find himself being worn out by such an undertaking. Have you not noticed that you find yourself uncharacteristically struggling just to read some passages? The syntax, the cadence, and the words seem strangely jagged and angular and unfamiliar. Passages seem to have changed, but you just have chalked it up to the idea that you were confusing it with other translations, and this is wearing you out. But could it be that when Daniel penned the words that the beast would think to change times and laws, that he could have been describing the event that people are claiming now? The vast swaths of history or time have changed for them, and many things, including the law of God, has changed for them. Is it feasible? to suggest that Daniel is actually describing an end times event 
where the beast would think to change space-time and the Bible? Let's take a look. A strict interpretation of the word translated time, the word zem, zem on, would be time, not calendars. So it's literally time. Your Bible actually says that he will think to change the flow of time. If you look at Job 14, 13, this is a passage that contains a word that would more closely represent a calendar or a set time. It's Strong's H2710, not H2166, which is translated time in Daniel 725. So the phrase that he would think to change time indicates his efforts may not be altogether successful. This is why we believe we find large amounts of residual evidence to support our vivid memories something we can discuss in a more detail in another video. The other thing that Daniel says the beast will seek to change is laws. Of course, all the commentaries give this passage a naturalistic treatment. They speak about the changing laws governing society, and I'm sure that will take place. They're not suggesting in any way that this could mean that the Antichrist would seek to change the Bible supernaturally, but how could they? How could the commentators suggest such a thing until it was happening, unless they themselves received a prophetic vision. But I am a, a Bible believer, and my Bible is a supernatural book, and the supernatural interpretation of this is perfectly fair, given the context and the meaning in the original language. When you look at the meaning of the word in the original, the context, and how it's been used, I believe it's very fair to suggest that it could be interpreted to mean the Bible itself especially since the word is translated law of God four times in the book of Ezra. Ezra 7.14 is an example to inquire concerning Judah and Jerusalem according to the law of thy God, which is in thy hand. And it's actually even translated law of God once right there in Daniel. Chapter 6, verse 5. So that being the case, you now appear to have a future end times prophecy that seems to say that the beast will covertly change the Bible by inserting blasphemies, errors, and innuendo throughout the Bible. And I don't really have a perfect theological answer for all the thorny doctrinal issues that this raises. I can only show you the evidence and be there with you while you mourn if you reluctantly concede that this is happening. Now, another passage that appears to be clearly speaking to this event is Amos 8. And this prophecy refers to a time when the end has come upon my people, Israel. And many commentaries agree that it is, has dual application to both the ancient nation of Israel and to modern nations descended from ancient Israel. A famine of hearing the truth occurs when the nations of Israel are taken over by a foreign power that prohibits the proclamation and practice of of the true biblical faith. This happened around 720 BC when Assyrians carried the northern ten tribes of Israel into captivity. According to many commentaries, it will happen again though during the tribulation when the modern descendants of ancient Israel are punished for their sins. But verse 9 even gives a signpost or time marker of this future event so that we can know exactly when this event will be taking place. There will be a sign in the sky that will be a signal that this famine talked about has commenced. Verse 9 reads, And it shall come to pass in that day. Now, which day are they talking about? That would be the day that there will be a famine. So what's this event? God says, I will make the sun go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in broad daylight. So when you see this event, that's a marker that this worldwide famine that's prophesied will be taking place. This famine of the word is not regional because it's sea to sea and north to east. And banning the Bible could not possibly make the Bible inaccessible in modernity because it would be preserved on too many different media to make this feasible. No, the real fulfillment of this prophecy as an end times event will be that the Bible will be so supernaturally changed that all the different 
attempts to read it will fail. It will become unrecognizable. And so I suggest we all have one good despair and get it over with and come join us because the time is running out. Well, it so happens that we now have this celestial event documented, and there are actually other documented events like this one. Uh, and you'll notice this was a event that was widely covered where a mystery surrounds Arctic Siberia as day turns to complete darkness for three hours. And you'll notice in this article that it started at around 1130. It happened at noon, just like Amos prophesied. And witnesses were quoted as saying that they had never seen anything like this before. And additionally, government weather channels indicated that in the region there was no clouds from weather, no clouds from fires, no clouds from dust or volcanic activity on that date and time. Well, then you have Revelation 22.18. And you simply have to ask yourself, why would God put this in there if it wasn't possible? Sure, it can be changed naturally, but it could also be supernaturally. Revelation 22, 18. God is saying, don't change my Bible. Now, the next few passages have to do with whether or not God would ever allow such a thing and whether the devil could possibly do this. The first, and I believe the most compelling, is Revelation 22, 10, where we have this passage. And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And the word seal is a very interesting word. It means a mark for security from Satan. Well, if you then modify that with the word not, you get a mark to protect from Satan not. Or, do not protect the prophecy from Satan. If you take the prophecy to mean the Bible, you now have a passage that specifically says, do not protect the Bible from Satan. Now, of course, Revelation is a difficult book to properly understand and exegete. And so, you know, you may have a different view on that. But it does say what I just said, in, at least for the book of Revelation. And so... The next passage that is um, presented itself was Revelation 13, 7, where it was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them, and it was given authority. One of the biggest objections to this idea is that the devil doesn't have that much power. Well, that's true unless God gives it to him. He's a defeated dog on a leash. But we're going back to the idea that God's divine perfection of allowing free will is unfathomable and the best theologians have debated it and here you have a passage clearly stating that in the last days he would give power and authority to do what wage war against god's people and overcome them to the point where in revelation 13 4 you hear this cry of who can make war with him and so if you could push buttons and pull levers and change history, I think people might say that about you. And then, of course, in 2 Thessalonians 2.9, you have this very interesting passage, speaking of this antichrist or beast doing signs and wonders. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power. Now, I always held that God alone had all power, yet here the Holy Spirit inspires Paul to use this imagery of the enemy of God having all power, which again would certainly be something you would think would be impossible to do what the Mandela effect claims to be doing unless you had all power. The so last point I'd like to make in this overview, just in summary, is how this could be possible. Even if there are prophecies that seem to predict it, how could this be true and it not make God a liar? And let me just restate that I am a friend of God. I love the Bible. I am claiming this event with the authority of Scripture behind me, as well as six other forms of evidence and millions of other people. And in the mouth of two or more witnesses, let all things be established. Now, I do technically fit the description of a heretic, but I am not the enemy of God, not by a long shot. 
So here is what I believe God has shown me so far. I've identified numerous concepts that allow this to be happening without undermining the integrity of God's word or his character. But I'm just going to briefly explore two of them. The first is the fact that inaccessibility does not impugn God's righteousness. And the second is that all of the promises of preservation are being fulfilled, even if the Bible's changing. It's just that the preservation of what has been given in the original autographs is being fulfilled in men's memories and their hearts, not necessarily on paper. So if the Bible teaches that the scripture cannot be changed, then the Mandela effect can't be happening. But if my position is the Bible most certainly is being changed, then I must conclude that the Bible doesn't teach that the scripture can't be changed. Does that make sense? You may disagree, but that's sound reasoning. Now, you may suggest that this is heresy, but I suggest that the passages that you're relying on are quite subjective and can easily be interpreted differently to come up with a different conclusion. In fact, Don Stewart is a conservative apologist that has published over 20 books on theological issues. His work can be seen at educatingtheworld.com. And Don points out that those who argue against the Bible teaching the providential preservation of Scripture, that's us, make the distinction between the divine inspiration of Scripture and its providential preservation. I don't question that the Bible is inspired by God, and it's not subject to any man's personal or private interpretation, and that what was given by God was immutable. We claim that there is nothing in the doctrine of the divine inspiration which necessitates that the Scripture be providentially preserved. The text used by those who claim Scripture does not indeed teach providential preservation have been either misunderstood or misused. That's our position. And that's an orthodox position that predates this Mandela effect. Now, this was not my position my entire Christian life, but it most certainly is now. So, Scripture refers to itself with at least 14 different terms. So, we have to ask ourselves, do all these terms mean the same thing? Now, I treat this topic and others in greater detail in other videos. I'm trying to keep this short, so I'll stop here for the sake of time. But you have Scripture, Holy Scriptures, the book, the Word of God, the Word, the sacred books, the scrolls, the law. Are all these things mean the same thing? You have to ask yourself that. So let's first consider this concept of inaccessibility. So we hold God to be righteous because he has created us in the image of himself with a conscience to know right and wrong. And although our conscience can be sufficient to discern right and wrong, we were also given the Bible to be able to have a more comprehensive understanding of what is right and wrong. We then hold God to be righteous as we observe him adhering to his own moral principles. In this case, not lying by saying the Bible can't change and then allowing it to be changed. But the concept of inaccessibility can be submitted to show how God could allow the devil to change the Bible without impugning his character in any way. If God gives his words to men on paper, but then allows missionaries to be murdered or arrested, or the Bibles confiscated, so they never reach the people they were intended for, is God unjust? Inaccessibility is quite common, but no theologian will hold God in derision because of it. If people are born and die without ever hearing the gospel or seeing a Bible, and as a result they go to hell, is God unjust? Inaccessibility to God's words is common, but no theologian would hold God in derision because of it. And so, even though men are in desperate need of God's word, free will, making it inaccessible, does not impugn God's character. And in a similar way, if free will is causing the Bible to be supernaturally changed and becoming inaccessible, it does not impugn God's character either. And so Amos 8 warns us of a day 
a last day's judgment when there will be a famine of the word where men will travel to and fro seeking the word but will not find it. Free will makes the word inaccessible through the instrument of the Mandela effect, but it does not mean that God has lied. His word is forever settled in heaven, but that does not necessarily mean the Bible won't change. You may be reading more into that than there is. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will pass away, not pass away, does not necessarily mean that God would not allow the Bible to be changed. That promise is easily fulfilled by the fact that that which was given to the original authors is preserved in the minds of men, as I will discuss in a moment. So, the real answer to this paradox then hinges on properly defining the term Word of God. So in Exodus 31.18, we see a clear distinction between these two different designations. Exodus 31.18, And when he had made an end of speaking with him, this is God speaking to Moses, that's the Word of God, on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tablets of the testimony, that's the scripture, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. So to properly divide the word on this matter, we need to be very strict with our semantics and stop assuming that the 14 different ways that the Bible refers to itself all mean the same thing. In this exchange between God and Moses, we see the clear divide between what is the word of God and the simple vessel or medium in which the Word of God is stored or carried, that is, the Scriptures. So, in order for the Bible to be supernaturally changing, without holding God in derision or lying, you would have to be willing to accept that the term Word of God would only refer to the inspired words recorded by the original authors in the original autographs and nothing else. Now, I don't think that's asking too much. Sufficient evidence exists, then, to support the idea that when the 1611 Cambridge version was created, it was done so in a manner that preserved the original text and is true enough to see these original autographs to still be considered the Word of God. It was and has been identical or near enough to the original to still retain the status of inspired. Those words were then transferred from paper into the hearts and minds of men. These thoughts that originated in God were transferred to the prophet and then to paper and then to all mankind. And so at this point, the passages that were retained in the minds of men were still consistent with the original autographs, and so they were still the word of God. However, once the Mandela effect attack commenced, most believe around the year 2016, the Word of God, which was recorded on paper, audio, or any medium, became susceptible to being changed, whereas the words that were stored in men's minds and hearts were more impervious to this change. Since the Mandela Effect changes things all the way back in time to the beginning of recorded history, even the original autographs that are on paper, they have been changed as well, and so they are no longer the Word of God. All the Bibles, commentaries, recordings, and writings have changed, and so they no longer fit the definition for the Word of God, for the most part. The only Word of God that remains is that which is stored in men's hearts and minds because it is still the same as the original autographs. What was given to Isaiah was the lion will lay down with the lamb. That is what we remember, and that is the Word of God. What you now read in the scriptures is the wolf will dwell with the lamb. That is not the word of God, because it's different than what was originally given by God. Since men still retain the word of God in their hearts, the promise of God to preserve his word is still true, and God has not lied. He's preserving his word. He's just not doing it on paper in this final dispensation of the church age. If the Amos 8 prophecy is describing the Mandela effect, then it is the judgment of God. This hypothesis should not be rejected because it's bad news. The entire book of Revelation is filled with events that could be considered bad news, but they are all of God. 
And maybe you're just a little bit closer to the book of Revelation than you previously thought. In these last moments of history, the church is being thrust into relying on an oral tradition, the Holy Spirit, and those who have hidden God's words in their heart. Humanity has relied on oral tradition from the beginning of time with great success. It is therefore not hard to conceive that God would return us to one in the end. So if you'd like to learn more information, I've prepared a variety of resources specifically for pastors regarding this phenomenon called the Mandela Effect. Head on over to hardestbiblequiz.com, click on the video archives link, and there you'll find a library sorted by category of short and long videos touching on different aspects of this phenomenon that will help you shorten your learning curve. Sign up for the free pastor's newsletter to be updated on special speakers, debates, live events, and new articles. Also check the calendar for weekly mastermind groups with a Q&A session just for pastors who have reluctantly conceded that this event is happening but are looking for support and answers. If you'd like to speak to me one-on-one, -on -one, feel free to send me an email with your name, phone, and best time to call, and I'll contact you as soon as I can. My email address is there on the screen. It's pleasewakeuporelse at gmail.com. Please take the time with an open mind to give this topic the serious consideration that it deserves before you make a final decision. Thanks again for your time today. I look forward to hearing from you soon.